Good morning, everyone. My name is Ollie, and I serve in the student community here at All Souls. Boys and girls, I wonder, did, did you go back to school this week? If you did, I imagine that you probably noticed quite a lot of changes compared to how things looked last year. You probably had to do lots of washing your hands. There were times in the day where you probably had to put your masks on. You probably weren't allowed to play stuck in the mud. Maybe you weren't even allowed to talk to your friends if they were in a different class to you. Our world has changed an awful lot over the last few months, hasn't it? And sometimes that can be very confusing and sad. But did you know that the more our world changes, the more our God stays the same? And because he stays the same, there are some things that we always do at church, whether we have to meet online like this or whether we're allowed to meet face to face in our building. So here's what you can expect during our time together this morning. God is always just, so we always confess our sins to him. God is always gracious and kind, so we are always assured of his forgiveness. God is always on his throne, so we always listen to what he has to say in his word, the Bible. And God is always glorious and good. So whenever we can at church, we love to sing his praise, not because we're any good at it, but because our God is worth singing about. So shall we do that now? Jump to your feet and let's sing for the whole of London to hear.
Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, family and friends, the scriptures tell us that we shouldn't hide our sins from God, but rather confess them to him and receive forgiveness out of God's infinite goodness and mercy. It's something we should do wherever we are all the time, but especially when we gather together as a family. So can I invite everyone who's willing, if you're up for it, to lift up your voice to that throne of heavenly grace with me and say these words. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. All souls, lang and place, take heart. Christ died for us once, and now he lives for us forever. So, merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, uh, boys and girls, how are you doing? Looks like some of you are sitting very well with crossed legs and crossed arms. Some of you are climbing over the sofa a little bit there. Well, wherever you are, gather around because now it's time for our family focus. So Kate and Anna, over to you. Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to our family focus. Today, we're going to hear a story from the Bible all about opposites. So we're going to play a quick game to get ready for the story. Are you ready? Are you ready? Anna, Anna, come over here for the game. Come over here. Hi. Hi, Anna. Are you ready for the game? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to say a word. You have to say the opposite. Are you okay. ready? Yeah. Here we go. Hot. Cold. Backwards. Forwards. Light. Dark. Smooth. Rough. Cactus. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I think I've got the meaning of opposite now. We're going to tell you a story from the Bible about a man called Jonah who did the opposite. But to tell the story, we're going to need your help. When I say the word opposite, I want you to say... Oh, sure. Shall we have a practice? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Opposite. Oh, sure. Okay, you ready? Here we go. This is Jonah. Jonah was a Hebrew who followed God. God said to Jonah, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because they are a wicked people. Hmm, Jonah doesn't look too happy about God's command. Let me tell you about Nineveh. Nineveh was a city filled with wicked, evil, violent people who didn't know God and lived as if it didn't matter that he was there. Jonah loved God. And so the idea of going to Nineveh was terrible. Why should he have to go there? They were evil. And he was a follower of God. Jonah thought they were the opposite to him. Oh, Jonah! So remember God, who is holy, loving, understanding and everywhere. That God told Jonah to go this way to Nineveh. This way. Can we all point this way? God told Jonah to go this way. You all pointing? But Jonah, Jonah did the opposite. Oh, Jonah! 
Jonah got on a ship and set sail for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Why did Jonah run to Tarshish? Did he really think he could run away from God? God who made the heavens, the earth, the land and the sea? God told him to go to Nineveh. So why did Jonah do the opposite? Oh, Jonah! Jonah ran away because the people of Nineveh were bad. He thought they didn't deserve God's forgiveness. And if we're really honest, do we ever think we know better than God? Do we think some people are so bad they don't deserve God's forgiveness? Maybe someone at your school who is always mean to you. Or the people you read about in the news who are horrible to others. But as we've seen over the summer, our God is loving, understanding and judge. He is the one who forgives. It is not for us to decide. Jonah ran away from God. He did the opposite. Oh, Jonah! Next week, we'll find out what happens to him. Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you that you are in control and ready to forgive. Please help us to tell the good news of Jesus to those around us, no matter what we might think of them or how hard it is. Thank you that you love the whole world. Amen. Our God made the land and the sea. So instead of running away from him, we run to him. And one of the ways we do that is by bringing our worries and our concerns to him in prayer. John Belling is going to lead us in praying to God now. Now we're going to have a time of prayer. Please do bow your heads and join with me as we pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being faithful to us. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. But Lord, we know as the world is in despair due to the pandemic and many lives have been lost and jobs have been lost, Lord, we mourn with those who have lost those loved ones and even lost jobs. But today, Lord, we pray for peace and comfort to all those that have been affected. And Lord, we also pray for provision 
for those seeking potentially new jobs. Lord, that you would guide each one of them. And more importantly, we pray that they would come to know you personally. Oh dear Lord, we pray for our mission partners today. We pray for Jeanette who works in the UK and India through design and business to support vulnerable women in communities, especially those that have been trafficked and are at risk. Dear Lord, we pray that you'd give her fruitful connections uh, in this difficult time uh, where COVID uh, and the lockdown restrictions have added further challenges to her and with the vulnerable women she works with and the businesses she's connected with. But dear Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Eritrea and the other Christians uh, around the world who are facing persecution simply for claiming that they love you. Father, we pray for peace and comfort and that a strengthening of their faith will be really real in their lives. So bring joy to them now and protection in their trials that they face. Dear Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray uh, even as the new rules of no more than six are allowed to gather outside. Father, we pray for patience and understanding uh, in the general public. And Father, we pray for a mutual respect from the government uh, and the people. And Father, we pray for patience on both sides. And dear Lord, we even pray for um, a, va a vaccine to, to be uh, produced soon in your perfect timing that uh, we would not have to worry and have to live with these restrictions any longer than is needed but father we we wait patiently until that time and we trust in you uh, that you will provide heavenly father we pray for uh, a government um, uh, just for wisdom and clarity uh, for wise decisions as they seek to make the correct ones in the coming weeks and months and potentially a difficult time during the winter when a potential second wave may come. And finally, Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for the uh, decision um, and search for the new rector. Dear Lord, we pray for the right person to come the person you have called, that even in this moment you're preparing his heart and leading him to come to all souls. We pray for just wisdom for all those involved in the search process. And Lord, we trust in you, in your perfect timing, that you will bring the right person. Father, we pray for us this morning. May you give us hearts and minds that are willing and attentive to, to hear what you would have us learn this morning. So, Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. We ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and your Savior and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thanks so much for tuning in today. It's that time of year when many new people join the church here at All Souls. It may be that you've taken up a new job in London, started at university, or simply looking for a new spiritual home. As a church, we're always keen to welcome newcomers. Of course, how we can do that all looks a bit different at the moment. But if you are based in London or plan to be based here in the near future, and if you are interested in making All Souls your church home and want to be part of life here, we really want to get in touch with you and welcome you into our church family. Can I encourage you to visit allsouls.org forward slash hello. The link is in the description below. And while we still have restrictions on meeting together, we believe the best place to start is in a small group. And on that link, you can find details of how to do that and be put in touch with the right people to help you.
And even if you have been attending All Souls for a while and have decided you want to join a small group for the first time, do also visit allsouls.org forward slash hello. Now we are so grateful that with the help of modern technology that we've been able to come together each week to worship like this. Yet I think we would all agree that we miss meeting together in person. It's why, while we are committed to our online services for the foreseeable future, we have also been working hard towards opening the church on Sunday to worship on site. We have met at 11.30 these last two months, and I am delighted to let you know that as of next Sunday, Sunday the 20th of September, we will be starting the 5.30 service here in church, subject, of course, to any new government restrictions. And we'll be in touch this week with more information if you'd like to join us next Sunday. So many things have been delayed by the lockdown, and one important issue is the need to update the electoral roll. As an evangelical Anglican church contending for the truth, the more people who sign up to the electoral roll strengthens our voice. So if you are part of our church family, please do make it a priority. You can sign up by following the link on the screen below. The Lord has been so kind to us as a church through these past months, and in large part, this is down to the generous financial support of you as our church family. Thank you. And as we remember each week, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. It really has been a huge blessing to begin to start using all souls again for worship and prayer. You see, a building like this makes so much possible so let's hear from Louise and Paul about what we need to do to help maintain this platform for the gospel and help us live out our vision to be all for Jesus. For the last six months or so, all many of us have seen from All Souls have been from this perspective. But beyond the camera, there's a whole building. Since July, we've begun to welcome people back into All Souls for a prayer during the week and for a single Sunday service. It hasn't been quite the same, of course, with social distancing, face masks, and not being able to sing, but it has been good to be back in the building and gathering to worship together. But not being able to meet for so long and then beginning to return has made us even more aware of how thankful we are for the strategic location and the striking building we have. For now, enough to allow social distancing, and for the future, enough to gather in much larger numbers again. Starting to reopen the building also reminds us of the work required to keep it running and fit for purpose. All Souls is nearly 200 years old. We will celebrate the building's birthday in 2024, and as many of you will be aware, the building needs some pretty urgent work to keep it watertight, ready to welcome worshippers, inquirers and visitors, and for the next 200 years. Last year, we launched a significant project to raise funds for these much needed repairs. The roof over the main part of the church is deteriorating and there's already some water coming in. Our storage for water is also long overdue a replacement um, and the front steps require a lot of restoration work. In short, we have to undertake repairs to the outside of the building and the roof space fairly urgently. Thanks to the generosity of the church family, including significant contributions from the church leadership, the fundraising project we launched last year has already passed the half million pound mark. But we still have some way to go. We need something like 1.2 million in total to undertake the work and to raise that money over the next 18 months. Our hope is that we'll be able to start working in early 2022 and have everything completed in good time for the church's 200th birthday. As Paul says, many people have already been extremely generous. If you'd like to help us keep All Souls as a gospel platform, there are details of how to give on our website. Some people are choosing to set up a standing order for a specific period. 18 months would take us to the envisaged start of the work. It's a tough, tough time for many financially, and we're acutely aware of that. Whether or not you feel able to support the project financially, please pray with us that it will be possible to fully reopen the church soon, that we will be able to complete this building project and that All Souls will have its doors wide open to welcome future generations to encounter Jesus and worship with us here. Thanks, Louise and Paul. 
We conclude our series in Ezra this morning. So pick up your Bibles and turn to chapter 10 as Kafun comes to read to us. Good morning. My name is Kafun and I serve as a mission partner with Friends International. Please be praying for the thousands of international students starting the academic year in UK universities this month, whether online or in person, that they would connect with Christians who will share the gospel with them. The reading is from Ezra chapter 10, verses 1 to 17. Ezra chapter 10, starting from verse 1. While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up, this matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. So Ezra rose up and put the leading priests and Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested. And they took the oath. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the room of Jehohanan, son of Eliashib. While he was there, he ate no food and drank no water, because he continued to mourn over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. A proclamation was then issued throughout Judah and Jerusalem for all the exiles to assemble in Jerusalem. Anyone who failed to appear within three days would forfeit all his property in accordance with the decision of the officials and elders, and would himself be expelled from the assembly of the exiles. Within the three days, all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem, and on the twelfth day of the ninth month, all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have been unfaithful, you have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now honour the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. The whole assembly responded with a loud voice, You are right, we must do as you say. But there are many people here and it is the rainy season so we cannot stand outside. Besides, this matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two because we have sinned greatly in this thing. Let our officials act for the whole assembly. Then let everyone in our towns who has married a foreign woman come at a set time, along with the elders and judges of each town, until the fierce anger of our God in this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, son of Asahel and Jazeah, son of Tikva, supported by Meshulam and Shabbatai the Levite, opposed this. So the exiles did as was proposed. Ezra the priest elected men who were family heads, one from each family division, and all of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to investigate the cases. And by the first day of the first month, they finished dealing with all the men who had married foreign women. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When did you realise this COVID thing was serious, that it would change our lives? Well, I guess step one for me was the moment I woke up to the gravity of the situation. And that was when my colleague Grace McDowell rang me up the night before lockdown was imposed and said, we need to meet at the office tonight at 10.30 and sort things out. We can't function when working from our homes. 
And then a couple of weeks into lockdown, my neighbor said to me, my mum just died of COVID in her old people's home and I wasn't allowed to see her. I had to say goodbye on the phone, his beloved mum. Then step two, you get the diagnosis of the problem. Yeah, you wake up, what's the problem? What's the diagnosis? Why is it so serious? Answer, COVID-19 is a virus that can be fatal, it's highly contagious, and we don't have a vaccine for it. So the only way to stop it spreading is to stop people meeting. Thirdly, radical action has to be taken. You can't just diagnose it, there's gotta be action. So in these exceptional circumstances of a national pandemic, some very tough decisions have to be made. You can only bubble with your household. You can only go out from the necessities or for 45 minutes a day. The police were in Regent's Park and stopped us as a family sitting down. We couldn't go away to see grandparents for half term. Uh, there were no weddings, only 12 were allowed at funerals. Fourthly, uh, there needs to be transparency in the leadership. People who make and impose these rules need to keep them themselves if trust is to be maintained, so they can't do a round trip to Barnard Castle to test their eyesight. Well, that was my experience of lockdown. I think it's pretty universal. You wake up to its seriousness, you diagnose the problem, uh, you take action, and if uh, you don't, more people will die. And to do all th these things, you need to get the leadership right. In Ezra 10, there's also a crisis and similar actions required, as I've thought about it this week. The temple has been rebuilt in Jerusalem, but God's law has not, is not, be, has not been obeyed. So the people of God are not gathering around the word of God and trusting God to lead them. The problem is sin. And that virus is far more deadly than COVID-19. You can't isolate from this in a household. It's in your heart. And it has an ally in the devil. And sin, if not dealt with, not only leads to death, it leads to hell, to a place of eternal punishment. So Jesus said in Luke 12, verse four and five, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. That's all COVID can do, just kill the body. But I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Sin is far more serious. It has eternal consequences. So what happens in Ezra chapter 10? Well, the way in which Ezra calls the people of God to deal with sin has its echo in the way in which we've had to deal with COVID-19. Number one, when it comes to sin, you have to wake up to the problem. Oh, I had to meet at the office at 10.30 p.m. I had a neighbor who couldn't say goodbye to his mum when she died. And in chapter 10, verse 1, they wake up to what sin has done to them. Verse 1, while Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women and children, gathered round him. They too wept bitterly. This theme of eyes being open to sin comes again and again in Scripture. So in Luke 15, verse 17, the prodigals come to his senses. He wakes up as he sees that his choice is to leave home, to leave his father, to be independent, to indulge in pleasure-seeking and crazy wild living, have landed him in a pigsty and a famine is coming, which will kill him. So he wakes up. He says, what have I done? I'm in a pigsty. How did I ever leave home? I'm gonna die. How could I have been so ungrateful? How could I have been so blind? What, what have my choices led me to? Last week in chapter nine, we saw Ezra waking up to the sin of the people. Verse three, when I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God, uh, uh, Israel, gathered around me. He prayed, I'm too ashamed and disgraced, my God to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached the heavens. Now Ezra is a leader. His life is marked by taking responsibility for God's people. That's what leadership it is. You take responsibility to guide them and teach them. And he knows that when it comes to sin, he can confess, weep and throw himself down to the floor. But as he speaks, 
the only thing that will change people's hearts is the convicting work of God's Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters, like us, he has to pray. He has to pray that people will see the horror of their sin, that they'll be convicted, that, it'll, that they'll see it'll take them to hell. He knows that God's people are in danger of committing the most terrible apostasy. Like their forefathers before them, they'd taken wives from surrounding pagan nations and were in danger of slipping into idolatry and bringing God's judgment on their own heads. This is, after all, what had destroyed King Solomon. In 1 Kings 11, after a glorious reign, having been lauded as the wisest man in the world, with the, the Queen of Sheba visiting, amazed at his wisdom, having been given peace by the Lord and, and incredible wealth, Solomon has his heart stolen by foreign wives, the wisest man in the world, and yet he couldn't escape the grip of his foreign wives and what they did to his heart as he fell in love with them and they led him into idolatry. And so we read 1 Kings 11 verse 4, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Amorites. And he sets up temples to them for his wives and Israel's led astray. So Ezra is praying, Lord, these people are blind to the danger, the danger that destroyed Solomon. He throws himself down in agony. Charles Spurgeon wrote about the importance of prayer. He said, prayer pulls the rope down below and the great bell rings above in the ears of God. Some scarcely ring the bell for they pray so sluggishly. Others give only the occasional jerk at the rope but he who communicates with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continuously with all his might. So as Ezra pulls the rope, he prays, God, wake them up. And can you see, as we learnt last week, he's not pointing the finger. Chapter 9, verse 3, he's appalled at the sins of his own people. Chapter 9, verse 6, he says, our sins are higher than our heads. This is in no way his personal sin, but these are his people. This, it's not a them, it's we. He says, it's us. It broke him to see what his people were doing. He's in mourning and he's saying, Holy Spirit, wake them up. It started with Ezra, but soon, chapter 10, verse 1, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered round him. They too wept bitterly. Soon others saw the issue, but it started with prayer. So let me ask you, will you join us? Uh, to pray at the 8 a.m. each weekday here at All Souls. It's a wonderful 20-minute prayer meeting, and uh, you can find details on the partner's email. We'd love to have more. Thanks to all those who come. But join us to pray. Be in a small group. And then secondly, will you pray for people's eyes to be opened and for non-Christians to come to the Life Explored course that begins online on Monday the 21st. It's new material. Um, uh, wonderfully, we've been rewriting during the lockdown. We've really got it so much better. But pray people will come and, and tell the story of their life and see the big story they could be um, in under Christ. But pray their eyes will be opened, they'll be hungry, they'll see their sin, they'll come to Christ. Life explored and come and pray with us at the 8 a.m. each weekday morning. Secondly, as with COVID, we have to diagnose the problem, verse 2. Then Shechaniah, son of Jethiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. We've been unfaithful to our God. Shechaniah realizes that the basis for the people's sin is not so much that they've broken the law of God, but they've broken their relationship with God. They've broken faith with their faithful God. He made them. He forgave them. He chose them to be his people. He said, he said call, call, call me Yahweh, my personal name, like the queen saying, call me Elizabeth. It's personal. He rescued them from Egypt. He gave them the promised land. He then sent them into exile to discipline them. And now they've turned away from him again, from him again. They've decided that they know better than God's word, that God can't be trusted, 
and that they've made up their own rules, deciding to live without reference to their creator. This was the sin that brought Solomon down and they haven't learned. Do they think they're wiser than Solomon? Oh, they haven't learned. In C.S. Lewis's science fiction book, Out of the Silent Planet, the hero, Dr. Ransom, has gone to the planet Mars and having learned to communicate with one of the Martian races who are called Saurans, he, he begins to try to explain to them about the people who live back on Earth. And Lewis writes this. Ransom decided from the outset that he would be quite frank and that it would be unavailing to do otherwise. They were astonished at what he had to tell them of human history, of wars, slavery and prostitution. It's because they have no God, said one of the younger Sorns. No, said an older and wiser Sorn. It's because every one of them wants to be a little God himself. They cannot help it. There must be some rule, but how can creatures rule themselves? It's like someone trying to lift themselves by their own hair, or like someone trying to see over the whole country when they're on the same level as the country. It's like a female trying to beget young herself. It's surely impossible. You see, Shekinah recognizes the problem of his people. They wanted simply to rule themselves. The temple may have been built in the center of their city, but they did not allow God to be in the center of their lives. And in this case, the part of God's law that had to be uh, put on one side is verse 2, that they'd married foreign women from the peoples around them. Now, as David Turner made clear last week, the issue here was not racial. There was never a blanket ban on Israelites marrying foreigners. Joseph, Moses, Boaz had married foreign women, and Ruth and Rahab, having married Israelite men, found themselves in the ancestral line of Jesus. No, the issue here is not ethnic or racial, but spiritual. It was a matter of unfaithfulness in getting caught up in the detestable practices of the Canaanites. Deuteronomy 7 uh, uh, had uh, issued a clear warning, verses 3 and 4, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they'll turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Now I say again, this injunction is not racial or ethnic, it's spiritual, but it does find its echo in the New Testament, as we learned last week. So 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 is clear. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? So it, so it is unfaithful for a committed Christian to marry an unbeliever. It's saying, the Lord is not the most important person in my life. For if my closest human relationship and my greatest human loyalty is to someone who does not follow the Lord, that will very likely have a detrimental effect on my relationship with the Lord. How can I follow him if the person I'm tied to doesn't want to go in that direction? It's so hard to serve him unreservedly, and yet so many committed Christians fall away by marrying a non-Christian. They risk missionary dating, and then like Solomon, their hearts are lost to a loved one who does not follow Christ, whose, whose life is full of idols. By contrast, a friend of mine, Dominic Steele, who's a pastor in Australia, told me that he was converted as the girl he was in love with said to him, Jesus is more important to me than you are. My first loyalty is to Christ. And so I, I can't go out with someone who wouldn't help me love and honor Christ and isn't following Christ himself. He then asked himself, well, who is Jesus? And as she modeled that Jesus was Lord, but didn't go out with him, God opened his blind eyes and he came to faith. We preach Christ as Lord, God opens blind eyes. Uh, having talked to my wife this week, Lucy, we spoke about how our hearts break when we see people marry non-Christians and walk away from Christ, or put him in the suburbs of their lives, not at the center. But on the flip side, we spoke about what a witness it is to us, what an encouragement, what an example we see when members of our church family courageously say, 
the Lord is the most important person in my life and I follow him wholeheartedly. And if there seems to be in his sovereignty no one to marry, then I'll simply focus on serving him in this short life. I'll give myself to his service. But what I won't do is enter a second marriage to a human being that'll take me away from my first one to Christ. And how all souls is built upon this backbone of single people who've given themselves wholeheartedly to Christ's service. Honestly, brothers and sisters, you're such an encouragement and example to us. Your wholehearted commitment to Jesus. Thank you. So that's the start of Ezra 10. They woke up to their sin and they diagnosed the key problem, unfaithfulness to God. But let me ask, where do you need to wake up? Can I ask you that? Where do you need to wake up? What are you suppressing in terms of the sin in your life? So Satan condemns, but the Holy Spirit convicts. He says it's this one area. Here, Rico, you need to confess and repent here. He says, this is it. King David prayed, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What hinders a closer walk with God? Let's ask the Lord to show us those dark spots. Let's confess them. And then, having pondered that in the break, let's come back and see how we deal with those places. A few years ago, BA flight 009 
from Australia to Indonesia was flying above the Indian Ocean, and suddenly the Boeing 747 almost began to free fall. The captain spoke on the intercom, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. Two of our engines have stopped. We're doing our best to get them going again. Please remain calm. Apparently, Charles Capewell and his son noticed smoke in the cabin. And the son, who tells this story, looked out of the window and saw flames coming from the engine. Dad, the engine's on fire. And his father responded, well, you better pull the blind down and pretend it's not happening. Pull the blind down, son. Pretend it's not happening. Now, that is always the temptation with sin in our own lives and in the church. We wake up to it, we might confess it, but then we pull the blind down. We don't repent, we don't take action. Uh, we try and ignore it rather than act upon God's word and make some very tough decisions to repent. And it's interesting here in verse four of chapter 10, there's a call for courage. Now, whether we agree with it or not, the government has made some very tough decisions to deal with COVID. Sin is far more serious. It can't just kill you. As I said it before, it can take you to hell. And radical action has to be taken to turn away from what the Bible says is wrong. Now, interestingly, just as amid the COVID-19 pandemic, in the Israel of Ezra's day, some tough decisions had to be made Verse three, now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my God and of those who fear the commands of our God. Now, before we go any further, let me state clearly, this is not what the New Testament tells Christians who are married to non-Christians to do. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12 and 13, the apostle Paul tells us, if any brother who has a wife who's not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who's not a believer and he's living to live, willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. So if we're married to somebody who's not a Christian, our calling is not to separate from them, but to do what the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, to win them over without words, when, we, when they see the purity and reverence of our lives. Well, there might be some speaking, but much more, says one Peter, it's living. It's a servant-hearted life, serving the Lord Jesus, serving the family. So you stay in the marriage, you stay with the kids, and you serve and pray for all your worth. But that's not what was the case in Ezra's day. Don't forget that the issue ruined King Solomon it stole his heart away and led Israel into idolatry. And Israel's calling was to be a light to the nations. And this intermarriage was going to snuff out that light. As Del Ralph Davis has written, is not Ezra chapter 9 and 10 a unique situation and a unique emergency? Remember what was at stake was the survival of a definable people of God in the world. A definable people of God in the world and their survival. That's what's at stake. And that particular calling to be God's people in God's world could only be maintained if they as a whole were willing to heed God's call to radical obedience and purity of lifestyle so that they are indeed a light on a hill. Israel needed to remain a distinct community so that the promises relating to the Messiah would be fulfilled. The future of the world was at stake. The advent of our Saviour hinged on the obedience of Ezra and the people of God. So though this chapter is not a paradigm for the church to follow when it comes to being married to unbelievers, it does, however, give us principles to help us to change and repent, to make tough decisions. When we, the church, are not living distinct lives, when we've embraced practices that dishonor Christ and disavow his lordship. So this chapter lays out steps that enable us to change and to be reformed into the people of God. So what are the steps of repentance here? Well, first of all, can you see in verses five to seven that two things go together? There's a public declaration of obedience and there's private prayer. So in both verses five and seven, there's a call to obedience for the whole people of God. And indeed in verse nine, 
on the 20th day of the ninth month, which is the 20th of December, 456 BC, they come together. But in the middle of that public declaration in verse 6, Ezra withdrew and ate no food and drank no water as he mourned over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. So he prayed privately and called people together publicly. And as a church family, it was wonderful to commit ourselves to be all for Jesus. And just my little family, we went up and we signed that huge board, All for Jesus, and made that public commitment. But alongside that, as a church, we prayed and prayed. In this case, it's estimated that 40,000 people gathered in the rain and cold, verse 9. The weather reflected the situation and the mood of the people. Miserable. And as they sat in the rain, Ezra diagnosed the problem and articulated the action that had to be taken, verses 10 and 11. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you've been unfaithful, you've married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now honour the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do this, separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. He stated their sin, he called them to confess it, and he didn't then pull the blind down and pretend it had never happened, but he called them to repent. He was calling them to become the distinct people of God. There would have been no excuses. They would have faced their sin, the gravity of the situation, but it would then take some time to work out this repentance. And we're told in verses 13 and 14, this matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two because we've sinned greatly in this thing. Let our officials act for the whole assembly. Then let everyone in our towns who's married a foreign woman come at a set time along with the elders and judges of each town until the fierce anger of our God in this matter is turned away from us. And in a crowd of 40,000, we learn that only four oppose this action. Gosh, how the Holy Spirit had worked in their hearts so that so many were saying, yes, this has to be done, because they were convicted of the rightness of God's word and of the action that had to be taken. And so we read verses 16 and 17. So the exiles did as was proposed. Ezra the priest selected men who were family heads, one from each family division, and all of them designated by name, on the first day of the 10th month, they sat down to investigate the cases, and by the first day of the first month, they finished dealing with all the men who'd married foreign women. So verse 16, it took them three months, 75 days to be precise, to listen to 111 cases. So they didn't rush the process. They were dealing with real lives, and real lives are complex. And so they systematically worked through the situation one by one, and it took them time. And that's important to note. Repentance needs to be decisive. There needs to be a commitment to change, but it can't always be worked out immediately. It takes time to unravel the complexities of sin in people's lives. The important thing is that they were committed to doing that. They were acting. They weren't pulling the blind down and saying, oh, well, that'll be too much of a mess. We're not going to look at that. It'll be too much conflict. I just don't want to do it. And the book ends with a list of all those people who'd intermarried. Uh, as we've seen all the way through the book, the details in these lists are very important. There are 111 people listed in verses 18 to 44. And it strikes me that 111 people out of 40,000 is not many, but when even a mi minority among God's people have sinned, it affects everyone. The Apostle Paul talks about a little yeast spreading through the whole dough. It affects everyone. Church discipline has to happen. My sin affects you, your sin affects me. We have to take repentance seriously because it's not just a private thing. Sin is radioactive. It impacts the whole church and the Holy Spirit departs unless we take sin seriously. Jesus threatens, he says, I'll remove my lampstand unless you repent in Revelation. 
So when even a relatively few people are not living a distinct Christian life in a church family, we're all affected. And that means if we're going to see reformation, we need to deal carefully and sensitively, even with a minority who are not living among us as they should. And it means we mustn't tolerate obvious sin when we become aware of it. And that takes courage. It's hard. But look what's at stake. Eternity's at stake. The other detail I note is this, that in this list, uh, the first people who are listed are leaders, verse 18. The priests, and then verse 23, the Levites. Verse 24, the singers and gatekeepers. Leaders need to repent first and be disciplined first. For if leaders are not leading by example, they cannot expect people to follow. We've had the same issues with COVID, both here and in Scotland. The leaders have to live out what they've taught and instructed. And if not, well, it goes through the whole batch. And so the book ends with God's people determined to be distinctive, taking drastic action to be distinctive, and when that final step is taken by the whole people of God, then a reformation is realized. Now, wonderfully, in the midst of all this, we have God's forgiveness. So we go to God for cleansing. Lord God, I'm sorry that I didn't take action when I could see sin. Lord God, this is my sin. Thank you that I get a fresh start, that I'm forgiven. I can be cleansed at the cross. But now help me to get up and fight and repent and not pull the blind down and pretend sin isn't happening because everyone's going to be affected. And what does it mean? Well, among other things at the moment, it means that when we think of the next rector of all souls, we need to pray that we'll have a man who's prepared to take tough decisions when it comes to enabling the church family corporately and individuals personally to repent. We need someone who takes God's word seriously and acts on it, however much the culture will hate that. And it means that we'll need an example to, throw, to flow through the church family that will reflect verse 4. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We'll support you. So take courage and do it. Let's pray together. Take courage and do it. Oh, Father God, please give us the courage to be those who repent of our own sin and who, as a church family, take repentance seriously, take action, help individuals to turn from their sin. So, Lord, we pray that we'd wake up to our sin, we'd diagnose it, and then we'd repent. We pray that would happen from the leaders downwards. And Lord, none of this can happen unless you cleanse us and you fill us with your spirit. Help us, we pray, for the honour of Christ. Amen.
you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. And you alone can rescue, you alone can save. To you alone belongs the highest praise. You alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been great to have you with us. As we draw to a close, let me lead us in a final prayer. Let's pray. Now honour the God, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. The whole assembly responded with a loud voice, you are right, we must do as you say. Heavenly Father, may we live as those who keep short accounts with you and others. May we confess our sins quickly, continually, and honestly. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us this day and forevermore. Amen.